Good morning. I'm Kim McCleary, President and CEO of the Los Angeles World Affairs Council and Town Hall. Thank you also very much for joining us. We are thrilled to be sharing yet another program that is part of our eight week 2020 election series. And we could not have done it without the generosity of our sponsors and help from our many community partners. Specifically, I would like to highlight our sponsors, Andrew Tavacoli and Dan Schnur, who are both board members, Dick Mader, an International Circle member, and Joel Mogi, a diplomat level member. Gentlemen, thank you so very much for your continued support of our organization and mission, and we hope everyone will enjoy today's program. If you want to submit a question to Ron or Dan, there's a control panel on the right-hand side of your screen where you can type in your questions. Claire Krellitz will be managing our questions during the Q&A portion of today's program in about 20 minutes. It is now my great pleasure to welcome you to Who Will Decide the Presidential Election, focusing on the key voters groups with Ron Brownstein, Senior Editor of The Atlantic and a Senior Analyst at CNN, and Politics Professor Dan Schnur, who teaches politics at UC Berkeley, USC, and Pepperdine. Ron and Dan, it's a thrill to have you both back on this very important topic, and we can't wait for today's discussion. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, Kim, thank you so much. And Ron, thank you very, very much for joining us. We know how busy you are, particularly this time of year. And we're really grateful that you were able to take some time to help us better understand the very confusing path between here and Election Day and, and possibly beyond. Uh, for those of you with long memories, you may remember uh, that last year we started a monthly breakfast series back when people met for breakfasts in person. Ron was one of our first guests and was fascinating then, and we know he's gonna be fascinating again today. So Ron, we're, we're grateful to have you back. You stole my line, Dan. I, I, was, I was lamenting, I mean, are we ever gonna be back having breakfasts again? Uh, that was really so nice in Culver City, but I'm glad to be with you virtually, if, uh, if not over a croissant. Well, I have read, uh, virtual croissants will be our, our next goal. Yeah. Um, I've read everything you've written recently, Ron, so I will do my best not to steal all the rest of your lines. Um, but let's dig right in because there's just so much to cover. Yeah. And so, Ron, all of us yeah, are just drowning in political analysis these days. Yeah. Yeah. Public opinion polls here, there, and everywhere. The number of swing states seem to have exploded. And the number of key demographic groups shaping this electorate. Yeah, as public opinion research gets more sophisticated, yeah, has become much more comprehensive and much more in-depth at all. So what I'm hoping you can do for us today is help us through some of this information overload. So let's start with the demographics of the electorate. And then I know you've written a lot recently about the three key geographic swing areas. So I wanna to get to that too. So I've read about suburban voters. I've read about seniors. I've read about white working class voters. I've read about young male minority voters. I've read all of these stories, Ron, Ron who is the most important demographic group in this country that will you know, ultimately this you know, The answer, of course, is there isn't one because all votes are fungible, right? And uh, elections are, modern elections in a country as diverse as the U.S. are something of Rubik's Cube where, you know, you, you might improve on one side and lose a little on the other. Uh, the basic, uh, you know, the basic structure of American elections have been the Democrats have won the popular vote in six of the past uh, seven elections. If they win it again this time, as which seems likely, uh, whatever happens in the Electoral College, uh, they will have won it in seven out of eight, which is something that no party has ever done since the formation of the modern party system uh, in 1828. No one's won seven popular vote uh, victories in less than nine elections before, not the Republicans in the decades after Abraham Lincoln, not the Democrats in the decades after FDR. But those, but these haven't been, you know, kind of uh, Ronald Reagan or Lyndon Johnson margins in the popular vote. Uh, they've generally been, uh, you know, in several cases, Clinton was under 50 or just right over 50 uh, with Obama. Uh, Gore also under 50, Clinton also under 50. We have been a closely divided country. Um, and the lines, I think, have become very sharply engraved, both demographically uh, and geographically. And they and they and they do they do overlap. You know, as you know, Dan, I believe the fundamental fault line in our society, uh, in our electorate, is no longer class. Uh, it is something much closer to culture. It, it is basically we have a democratic coalition that uh, revolves around the places and the people who are most comfortable with the way the country is evolving. 
demographically, culturally, even economically, and a Republican coalition uh, that is uh, centered on the places and people who are the most uneasy and even hostile to the way the country is evolving. And I call this the coalition of transformation and the coalition of restoration. This predates Trump. He didn't create this alignment. Uh, but he has enormously intensified and accelerated it because he's leaned into it. I mean, he has basically governed uh, as the president of Red America in many ways as a wartime president against Blue America. I mean, rather than trying to court the parts of the country or the constituencies uh, that didn't vote for him, uh, he has uh, focused more on demonizing them to try to mobilize his own side. So what, what do the two sides look like? I mean, basically, you have a Republican coalition that relies primarily on uh, white voters without a college degree, white voters who are Christians, particularly evangelical Christians, and white voters who live outside of, of, of urban centers, uh, and until recently uh, relied very heavily on white voters over 45. Donald Trump got over 60% of his votes in 2016 uh, from whites over 45. About 90% of Republican votes still come from whites in a country that is now 40% uh, non-white. Democratic coalition and 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 all of those groups tend to be centered much more outside of the major metros. Democratic coalition is pretty much the inverse. It's white collar, diverse, younger, secular, info age, and concentrated in the metros. Hillary Clinton won more than half of all of her total votes just from the 100 largest counties in America. So you have this very clear and consistent divide that, as I said, leaves Democrats in a position where their coalition is slightly larger. I mean, it, I, I think that's it's unequivocal. But the way the Electoral College works, the way the Senate works, doesn't mean that coalition always governs. And in the states that are at the tipping point, small changes at the margin can matter a lot, like, uh, as you, I think, alluded to, Trump is losing, has lost altitude among seniors relative to 2016 and even 2018. Uh, he is at risk of being the first Republican since um, uh, uh, George Bush in 2000 to lose seniors. Uh, and conversely, there is some movement toward Trump among younger Black and Hispanic men, which uh, is giving Democrats a little bit of heartburn uh, in states like Arizona and North Carolina. Well, in those two paragraphs, Ron, you've managed to give me no fewer than 95 follow-up questions, and I yes. don't think I'll be able to get to all of them. Um, I will also note that your references to the Electoral College, I know our audience pretty well given this series and our, our Thursday weekly webinars, we're almost certain to get questions about the Electoral College later, so, so brace on that. Okay. But, let's, but, let's, but let's do this. Um, you talked about, and your, your, your cultural analysis, I think I agree, and I think most people who watch this stuff closely agree, is, is just dead on. And so that takes us back to the 2016 election, when these culturally conservative, white voters without the benefit of a college education turned out in much larger numbers than expected for Trump right. than they had for Romney or McCain right. or Bush. Th three years, 11 months, and two weeks later, where are those voters now? So um, Trump is still very strong among working whites without a college degree, but he's not quite as strong as he was in 2016. And that is that is a challenge for him. And there's also a significant a regional divergence. Uh, you know, part of the problem with kind of assessing where we are now is that we have literally six or seven different data sources about what happened in 2016, and they all disagree a little bit. Exit polls, the Pew validated voters, the CCES, the American National Election Studies, which all go all the way back to 1952, Catalyst, which is a Democratic targeting firm, the States of Change Project, they all give you slightly different numbers. Uh, uh, but all of them sort of converged that Donald Trump probably won somewhere between 63, 64, and at the upside, 67% of whites without a college degree. Um, this time, he's coming in more like 60, 61%. And there is a significant regional divergence. Uh, New York Times poll out today in Georgia, he's still at 76% among them in Georgia. North Carolina, uh, ABC Washington Post poll today, he's at 67% among them uh, uh, in, in, South, in North Carolina. South Carolina, two thirds. Uh, Florida, often two thirds. Uh, Sunbelt, Southern, I shouldn't say su Sunbelt, Southern, Southeastern non-college whites, towering margins. That's what makes states like Georgia and North Carolina so hard. Different story in the Rust Belt. You know, if you think about Joe Biden, he's a 77-year-old white Catholic who has kind of been a centrist Democrat, really hasn't made a lot of waves, uh, hasn't kind of been out there redefining the party. 
he wasn't hired. The Democratic Party didn't hire him because they thought a, a candidate with that profile was the, was the one to finally pick the lock and figure out how to turn out a lot more younger non-white non voters, especially in, uh, in the Sun Belt. They hired him, job one, as they used to say at Ford, was to win back more white voters in the Rust Belt, particularly working class whites. And you know what? He's doing it. Uh, not at like great shakes levels, but pretty consistently, at, you know, I, I've tweeted about this, I've written about this. It doesn't matter whether you're talking about Michigan, Pennsylvania, or Wisconsin, which are the inner tier of competitive states in the Rust Belt, or Minnesota, Ohio, or Iowa, which is the outer tier. Um, in all of them, Joe Biden is running right around 40% among whites without a college degree, usually a little less, sometimes a little more, but generally right around 40%, which again, doesn't sound like great shakes, um, but Hillary Clinton was usually at 35% or less, depending on the data source. And you know the gains are particularly among those blue collar white women who started moving away a little bit from the Republicans in 2018, largely around their efforts to repeal the ACA, uh, but also find it difficult to explain Trump's antics to their kids, even if they may share some of his same cultural sentiments and resentments. I think there are a lot of mothers who don't want to explain to their 12 year old why they can't tell a classmate to go back where they came from. Um, so, uh, overall, non-college whites are still very strong for Trump, but you know, as I've as I've said, he has alienated everyone else outside of his core groups of, of uh, evangelical, non-college, and non-urban whites. That he has to post historic numbers every time among those groups. It's like making a plan to start your baseball season uh, every year. You you know you plan on hitting 406, right? I mean, <laughs> the last time that happened was 1941. So. If you're if you're in a situation where you're still winning 60% of non-college whites in the Rust Belt and probably a little north of that nationally, and that's leaving you way short, maybe you've cast too narrow a net in trying to get to a majority. Okay, so it's three more paragraphs, 95 more follow-up questions. At this rate, Ron, we are going to keep you here yeah. until the polls close on election night. Um, the place where I'll, 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 I'll follow up, though, at least to begin with, is in brief, just in passing, uh, you talked um, about female voters. Yeah. And among this white working class in particular, to the extent that Trump's numbers have fallen off in these Rust Belt, Rust Belt states, it is as a result of a growing gender gap, is it not? Yes. Yeah. Well, look, I, it's interesting because the polling on white women, first of all, white women without a college degree are the single biggest reason Donald Trump is president uh, because his number, I think, his numbers among them, and if you answer the question before, if like who is like the pivotal group, I suppose you could, you might be able to point to them, uh, maybe a little more than anybody else, just because of their distribution. Uh, his numbers among them were enormous in 2016. I mean, you know, somewhere uh, in the 55 to 60 percent range of white women without a college degree picked him over the first female major party nominee, particularly in those uh, midwestern states, and that is why I think he's president. Um, uh, the polling on them is a little all, all over the place, particularly the national polling on whether or not Trump, uh, to what extent Trump is eroding among them. Uh, you know, the, the New York Times national poll today, I think, put that put uh, Trump still very, very strong among them in the in the 60 percent range. Um, but there has been polling in those Rust Belt states showing a decline. And um, I think it is likely that he will slip. Uh, with those voters relative to 2016. Don't forget also, uh, uh, you know, a lot of non-college white women are seniors. I mean, you know, just think about it, 80% of the baby boom is white. Uh, it's it's higher for earlier generations. So, and not and not that many people went, not as many people went to college before the 60s. So, you know, a lot of non-college whites are older. Uh, and, you know, Trump's uh, slippage among seniors due to his handling of coronavirus is real. I mean, it's it's a real thing. And um, uh, so that could be cutting into his numbers as well. I don't think he's going to match his numbers among non-college white women uh, at, to 2016. And that obviously creates an enormous hurdle because his whole game, when you kind of look at everything he's doing, it's not about persuading the existing electorate. It's about changing the electorate. I mean, he thinks his path to victory is turning out even more non-college and non-urban whites than pollsters are expecting, which you know, sure, he could do. And there are some Democrats, as I wrote today, who are nervous about what they're seeing in the early voting among non-college whites. Um, but if his margins among them is not are not quite what they were last time, uh, that obviously kind of uh, dilutes the impact of any turnout surge that he can generate. 
Okay, and so let's let, let's pick up on on senior voters then, mm -hmm. um, because in fact, even before the pandemic reached uh, our shores, there was already some evidence yeah. of him losing support among older voters. But no question, it has accelerated since March. And one of the things that leapt out to me in that New York Times Siena poll this morning was, while most Americans believe it's important to wear a mask, not surprisingly, older voters believe that yeah. in, even, in, in even larger numbers. Yeah. Well, look, no Democrat has won seniors since Al Gore in 2000, all races. I'm sure if we looked only at white seniors, it goes back even further. Uh, uh, you know, the, the idea of seniors as a Democratic constituency is kind of, uh, you know, you know, thankful to Franklin Roosevelt for Social Security and Medicare is is something in our past. Um, but and we didn't even see, you know, Trump won 60 percent of whites over 45 in 2016. So he was solid. And we didn't really see much slippage in 2018. Um, it's it's a new phenomenon. And, uh, it, you know, uh, some people think it is partly because uh, seniors have seen more presidents and they have a better baseline against which to measure how aberrant Trump's behavior is. But I think clearly it's COVID. Uh, and in the end, he is probably going to win white seniors. He might win seniors overall, but he's not going to win them by anything like the margin that he did. I think he won all seniors by eight points last time. Again, you know, choose your data source. Uh, and I don't think he's going to get there. And, you know, one thing about seniors is um, it's applicable in a lot of places. I mean, it matters in Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin, which are older states, but it also really matters in Florida and Arizona. And for all of the gains among college whites in Arizona, and, uh, and also in Florida, uh, the ability to just, you know, uh, improve by a few points among seniors is really important to why Biden is so competitive in those states. So if, if, if Trump is, is, is losing ground among these white female voters without a college education, if he's losing ground among seniors, um, where is his potential for gain? Yeah, uh, well, uh, in terms of share, vote share, his potential for gain is younger black and Hispanic men, really. I mean, he could do a little better with both of them. Uh, uh, you know, the, the resistance he faces among female voters uh, who are black or Hispanic is so towering that, uh, you know, it limits his potential upside. But there's a lot of suggestion that he might do a little better among black men and Hispanic men. And with Hispanics might, might also be older men, men too, um, you know, which is kind of striking given everything that's happened in this presidency, child separation and rapists and murderers and everything else. Um, but again, I don't think his, I mean, and, and that might, you know, could there be enough of that to help him save North Carolina, maybe? I mean, that would be the one state perhaps. And certainly you, you know what you're seeing with the, the uh, Cuban American population in Florida could help him save Florida. Um, uh, but I think by and large, Dan, his play is not so much changing the preferences of the group. It's changing the share of the electorate that groups constantly. And, and as you said earlier, turning out those white working class voters, particularly white working class, culturally conservative men in historically high numbers, but at least in some of those upper Midwestern states, not historically unprecedented numbers. No. George W. Bush, for example, turned out those voters at much higher levels in 2004 than than, yeah. uh, than Trump has, correct? Yeah, and I mean, uh, look, I mean, uh, as David Wasserman, my friend and former uh, next door office mate at the Watergate, uh, the office of the Atlantic, uh, before I had the good sense to move to California, back to California, uh, will point out to you, a majority of the people who are eligible to vote but didn't in those Rust Belt states are non-college whites which is different than the Sun Belt, where a majority of the eligible non-voters in 2016 were a combination of college whites and non-whites. Also, if you look at the Sun Belt, the, the, the vast majority of people who have aged into the electorate since 2016 who have turned 18 uh, are people of color. Uh, and uh, in, the, uh, in the Rust Belt, it's still white, you know, uh, still 18 year olds are, are still majority white. So yeah, I mean, there's an audience there. The problem he's got is that everybody's voting. Uh, you know, look at the numbers in Dane County. Uh, or what's going to happen in Oakland County. Um, you know, I think there is still some question about whether uh, Wayne County, uh, which is Detroit, or Cuyahoga, which is Cleveland, uh, or Philadelphia, is going to recover to the levels that we saw under Obama. But I think there's no question that the turnout in these big white collar uh, prospering suburbs is going to be off the charts and the numbers are going to be off the charts. I mean, Hillary Clinton won the four suburban counties outside of Philadelphia by 65,000 more votes than, by, uh, than Obama did. And I would feel pretty comfortable that, that um, Biden is going to win them by more than she did. Uh, in many ways, 
the, the key battleground, in, at least in the Rust Belt states, are going to be these mid-size, you know, heavily blue-collar cities, the Racine, Kenosha, Erie, Wilkes-Barre, uh, Scranton, uh, you know, place, Youngstown, Toledo, Akron, you name it, Marshalltown, you know, in Iowa. Uh, Biden doesn't have to win them. Uh, many of them voted for Obama. They moved very sharply to Trump or Janesville. Uh, even if even if Hillary Clinton won them, the margins were way down. It was kind of a uniform movement. I think I calculated today for that story I ran 138 counties in the Rust Belt in those six states. Trump ran at least 10 points better than Romney did. 138 out of like basically 500. So um, you know, uh, again, the challenge for Trump. I mean, not that he can't do it. I mean, I don't I don't rule it out. Uh, you know, I mean, anybody who's still hanging around 60% of non-college whites. You have to say they have a shot in, in states where non-college whites are half or more of the voters. Uh, but the problem he's got is everybody else's vote. And uh, you know his, his electorate, uh, to some extent, he has to run paddle faster just to stay in place because his electorate is shrinking as a share of eligible voters, even in those states, even in Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Minnesota, Ohio, and Iowa. Non-college whites will be at least two and sometimes three points less of the eligible voting population in 2020 than they were in 2016. Hey, Dan, this is the moment where I have to uh, kind of move to the stand-up portion of the uh, of the panel, uh, owing to a recent back uh, uh, mess. So I'm just gonna I'm gonna um, uh, I'm gonna move myself to a standing while you ask a question, if that's okay. Not a problem at all. These were, as we talked about earlier, injuries incurred. I can't remember fighting off a mob of either Proud Boys or Antifa. We can come back to that or both. Or later. Both. A rare, okay. team, rare team. Well, that's a very authoritative pose, Ron. Yeah, so that, you know, I'm thinking I, I would be talking from behind a podium anyway, or in a chair. So, <laughs> it shouldn't be that. so apologies to anybody out there. But yeah. Okay. So, you know, as, as tends to happen in conversations about national politics these days, we seem to have neglected the fact that there was a second candidate running for president. Yes. And so if we can, for just a minute, talk about Joe Biden. And it seems to me what, what his campaign has done, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, Ron is has made a calculated gamble. And they've decided that in order to make a full-throated effort for these working class voters, and other swing voters we were talking about earlier, they're essentially gambling that rather than devoting a great deal of time and energy to motivating their party's base, young people, voters from minority communities, they decided to gamble that rather than having Biden spend time motivating those voters, they're uh, relying on the fact that Trump will. Is yeah. Uh, should Biden be spending more time talking to the base of his own party, or is this the appropriate strategy for him to be pursuing? Well, the, the key words in that sentence, Dan, are for him, right? I mean, as I said before, uh, first of all, no can. If you if you think about the long pathway after 2016, there were two competing theories in the Democratic Party about how you beat Trump. One was to reassure white voters, primarily white voters. Uh, who were ordinarily Republican leaning, but find Trump personally unacceptable. Uh, and the other theory was that you win by turning out more of your core voters, particularly younger voters and voters of color who really don't like him. Um, and I think you saw, you know, those two arguments uh, play out in the primary. People like Castro, Harris, and in her way, certainly Bernie and Warren were in the mobilized camp, uh, and Biden was the clear leader. Buttigieg in his, his own way, uh, Bennett. Uh, in in the in the reassure camp, um, they nominated Joe Biden. Joe Biden, as I said before, is not the candidate who you would draw up in the lab to pick the lock of how to finally increase, uh, meaningfully increase turnout among uh, Hispanic voters, which has been a struggle for Democrats in every election. I mean, it was well under 50 percent in 2016. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, while he is very popular among older African-Americans, I mean, you know, he's a 77-year-old white guy who's been in Washington for 50 years and who wrote the crime bill in 1994. I mean, he's not the ideal candidate to turn out younger black voters. So I think by necessity, uh, you know, if you nominate Joe Biden, you're betting more on a strategy of reassuring uh, uh, previously Republican-leaning white voters uh, that it's okay to cross over this time and vote for Joe Biden. And I think that is working pretty well. I mean, they have put, you know, first of all, he has more validate, he has more cross crossover endorsements from leading figures in the opposite party 
I believe than any nominee ever. I mean, I wrote a piece a few months ago saying it was the most since Nixon in 72 with John Connolly and Democrats for Nixon. But I think when we start adding Cindy McCain and Tom Ridge and William McRaven, I mean, we are way past, half of George Bush's cabinet have endorsed uh, Biden. So you are getting a lot of signals for center-right white voters, I think particularly men, uh, that, uh, that it's okay to do this. And um, uh, I think you see that reflected in his numbers among college-educated white men. I mean, yes, Biden is going to uh, have a towering margin among college-educated white women. It's not clear, though, how much bigger that's going to be than Hillary or the Democrats in 2018. Uh, they were, you know, these voters have been moving toward Democrats for years, and Trump obviously kind of pushed them out the door further. But the college white men, they've been reliably Republican. I mean, Republicans won two-thirds of them in the 2010 and 2014 um, midterm sweeps. Biden's polling usually about 55% among them, you know, 55, 56, 57. I mean, that's, that's fairly inconceivable. I'm sure, you know, from your own political experience, I mean, the idea of Democrats winning 57% of college white men outside of California and Colorado uh, just doesn't happen. And I think that is largely a function of Biden being okay, acceptable. And, and, and for that matter, to many of the blue collar of white women who are culturally much more conservative than the Democratic coalition, who are more likely to view immigrants as kind of a threat to the more, you know, to the direction of the country and to worry about crime and disorder. I mean, they respond to a lot of Republican messages. I remember in 2018, talking to a Democratic uh, strategist about what they were talking, how they were trying to appeal to these blue collar white women. And he said, essentially, uh, protecting pre existing conditions through the ACA and protecting Medicare. And he said something that stuck with me ever since. He said, basically, they, he said, there is nothing else that we are selling that they are interested in. Um, so, so that's that's kind of, but, you know, again, Biden, you know, Biden is reassurance. He's not mobilization. And and maybe all of the outside effort, the amazing amount of money and un unbelievable amounts of money that are being raised can do that. I don't know. I, I, I don't know if we're going to see huge uh, Hispanic turnout. I don't know if we're going to see huge turnout among younger African Americans, but I do think the older African Americans are going to turn out, and I think college white turnout will be the highest ever. So I think really, really important point um, that this might not be the strategy that Beto O'Rourke would have been following if he were the Democratic nominee for president, but for Joe Biden, it's the one that makes the most sense. The only one, really. I don't think he can execute the other one. Do you? I mean, could he? No. I mean, would you bet? Would you bet the election on Joe Biden being the, the guy who figures out how to get younger Hispanic men in Arizona who don't vote to vote? I, I, I wouldn't have my, I wouldn't have the presidency on that. I stopped betting on politics three years, eleven months, and two weeks ago. But I, I'll take your point. Yes. So Claire Prelitz, who is stepping in for Jessica today to help us with audience questions, has been clawing uh, to get me to turn over this conversation to broaden it a bit. But Claire, if I can, can I ask Ron just to clarify very quickly one point that he made in his last answer? Ron, you were talking about how Biden has reached into the ranks of traditionally Republican voters. You can call yeah. them Romney Republicans, Bush Republicans, pre-Trump Republicans, post-Trump Republicans, whatever you call them. And you said um, half of the Bush cabinet is endorsed yeah. by Biden. Exactly. I just want to clarify whether that is actual data or whether that's... No, uh, I, think, I, think, I, think, I think it's seven. I think it's like Carlos Gutierrez, Tom Ridge, uh, Chertoff, and Veneman, the agriculture secretary. I think there are three more. I think there are seven former Bush cabinet officials who have endorsed Biden. Plus, you know, senior staff for McCain, Romney, and W's campaign, 500 national security, I think about half a dozen former Republican governors at this point, Chrissy Todd Whitman and John Kasich and uh, Jim Edgar, uh, you know, dozens of former House and Senate members, Cindy McCain. Uh, so uh, it, it, is, it is extraordinary what we are seeing. It is also extraordinary that after 220,000 people are dead, the economy is in shambles, uh, uh, the president has kind of openly solicited uh, white racial violence uh, at the election. He's still in the game. And that is kind of a sobering reminder of how big a piece of the country, how alienated they feel from what the how the country is evolving. And, you know, if, you know, as I often say, if this much of white, of Christian white and non-college white America is open to a Trump-style message of kind of racial identity and, and, and racial backlash, 
when they are 43% of the population? What makes us think that fewer of them are going to be open to it when they're 38% of the population, which is what is coming in the 2020s? Okay. Claire, I'm going to guess from our past experience with having Ron as a guest that there might be just one or two or possibly even three questions that have come in for him. Yep, we have a ton of questions. Oh, cool. um, and so, okay, great. So we'll dive right into it. Um, the first audience member says, Dan has said that poll numbers are just a snapshot of a moment in time. Poll numbers in 2016 were not accurate. Why are we still dwelling on poll numbers? Well, we can go back to the 2016. Poll number, the national poll numbers were actually quite accurate. I mean, they, they were within a point of the final result. The problem was, in the key states in the Rust Belt, as we've been discussing, uh, polls underestimated the share of the vote that would be cast by non-college whites. Um, and as a result, since Trump was winning them roughly three to two, uh, that shift in the composition of the electorate um, uh, showed those polls to be wrong. They all had Clinton winning by narrow margins and then Trump won, obviously by a combined 77,000 votes across the three states. Um, pollsters have tried to uh, deal with that by waiting for education. Uh, but there is always the risk, as I said, that is that is his pathway to winning, which is that he produces an electorate different than anyone expects. So you can, you know, a nine or 10 point lead in the national polling, it's hard to believe that that is, uh, you know, that that's completely a, uh, a, a myth, uh, but, you know, no one should act as though, uh, you know, the polls are not uh, divining the future. And the, the question of who shows up uh, ultimately matters a lot. But I would say that the polling is different enough from 2016 in those states now where Clinton was ahead by two points maybe or three generally. Uh, and now we're looking at seven to nine in the big three um, that it isn't exactly the same. Plus and we're gonna have some people voting. I mean, it's like, it's like we're, we're kind of past polling. If we have 75 or 80 million people, Michael McDonald said 85 million people are gonna vote before election day. Oh, I think it's also worth noting, we've talked about this in past programs, um, that this isn't unique. Even the most sophisticated polling is making an estimate on who's going to turn out on election day and who's not. And just as in 2016, very smart pollsters underestimated how successful Trump would be in turning out these white working class voters. Those same really smart people underestimated how successful Barack Obama would be in turning out young people and voters from minority communities in 2012. The difference yep. is in 2012, it was, the it was the distinction between a narrow Obama victory and a wider Obama victory, as opposed to a narrow Trump versus victory versus a narrow Clinton one. So mm -hmm. that's why they have margins of error, right, Ron? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that, you know, look, the, um, uh, yes, I, I, that's basically right. Let's go, let's, let's move on. Great. So, so kind of on the topic of polling, this this next person is saying, if Trump has hope, it seems likely to come from the large portion of registered voters in Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania who did not vote in 2016 um, in that Trump demographic group of non-college educated white voters. Um, and so, is it safe to assume that the that the polling will capture whether this group is going to turn out or not? Right. Well, I, look, I mean, that is that is the you know, what is that? That is the 80 million vote question. Uh, 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 you know, absolutely. I mean, I, I know there are Democrats who are nervous about what they are seeing in the early voting in those states where non-college and rural white participation is very high and uh, young and African-American turnout isn't quite what they would hope. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that is that is the core issue. I mean, so far, as I said, pollsters have tried to adjust to this. Um, uh, and, uh, but if, if that is the way he wins, I mean, I think there's one way Donald Trump wins. It, it's if he turns out more non-urban, non-college white voters in the critical state than pollsters expect. And again, I would just say that it's a little tougher than last time because not only did he turn out more of his side, turnout was down lower than expected uh, for key Democratic groups, particularly African-Americans. I don't think we're getting back to the 2012 level of black turnout, but I don't think it'll be 2016 either. I think it'll be it'll be somewhere in between. I think youth turnout's gonna be better than 2016. And I think college white turnout in these suburbs, as I said, is gonna be through the roof, whether we're talking about Austin or Denver uh, or uh, Madison. Uh, it, here's an example. Uh, you know, it, it is possible that uh, in, in 2014, when Mark, uh, when uh, Cory Gardner beat Mark Udall, 
he held down the margin in the in Denver and the three surrounding counties to about 100,000 votes. It could hit 400,000 votes in this election. So that's what we're talking about in these big metros. And if that's the case, just think of how many rural and small town and mid-sized blue collar whites you have to turn out to equal, much less overwhelm that. It can be done, but the hill is a little steeper. Ron, you mentioned briefly earlier that because of the large number of mail votes and early voting, it's not just a matter of looking at polling, but we can actually see early voting trends. Historically, young people and voters from minority communities have been less likely to vote by mail and to vote early. Is there any indication this year so far whether those trends are changing or not, do you know? I think the indication is no. I mean, I, I mean, I haven't, I, you know, we don't know exactly who's voting. We have modeling from different sources. Uh, I think the, basically, the modeling that I've seen from democratic groups, and I've seen actually some pretty sophisticated modeling that people have done, college whites are voting the most, followed by non-college whites, rural whites, then African-Americans, then Hispanics. And young people, I think, are, I think they're kind of where they've always been. So uh, historically. Historically. But, but again, I mean, part of the, you know, as this, re, as this realignment, what I call the class inversion has happened, where, you know, we've gone from a Democratic Party that was centered on working class voters to a Democratic Party that's now much stronger among college whites and then non-whites. Um, just think about the implications of that. I mean, the, the college whites turn out 20 points higher as a share of eligible. The, the, the college white turnout is consistently 20 points higher than the non-college white turnout, by which I mean, if 59% of, of non-college whites turn out, it's 79 among college whites. So Democrats are now benefiting from the group that is the most likely of all to vote. And by the way, uh, there is no way to explain these extraordinary Democratic fundraising numbers, not only for Biden, but for Senate candidates, except as another manifestation of the realignment of kind of the white upper middle class toward the Democrats. I mean, that is a very tangible measure of what Trump is doing to the Republican Party by essentially identifying it with the cultural, with opposition to kind of modern America in a way that is culturally very difficult to you know, kind of sell in a in a suburban office park outside of uh, outside of Atlanta. I have ninety five more follow up questions, but Claire, let's go and okay. let's go back to our audience. <laughs> All right, great. So we have some people wondering about evangelicals. So a couple of questions here. Do you believe that Biden is making any progress at all with white evangelicals? And then, um, how important is the vote of anti Trump or Republicans like those in the Lincoln Project and evangelicals? So I don't think he's making any appreciable progress among evangelicals. He might be making progress among white Catholics and white mainline Protestants. Again, polling varies a little bit on that because it's, we don't always look at it uh, that you know, we don't have samples big enough to answer. But I think the evidence is pretty clear that Trump is still going to come in somewhere around 80 percent among white evangelicals, which is roughly what he what he got and what Republicans get. I mean, you know, Roy Moore got 80 percent of white evangelicals, you know, and, and he hung around malls, you know. So it is what it is, as as uh, someone would say. Uh, the never Trumpers matter. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, the Lincoln Project has had one goal. I mean, it's not like it's an interesting thing because it's not they're not they're narrow casting. I mean, their entire raison d'etre, all of their advertising, all of their focus is moving college white Republican leaning voters away from Trump. And Ron, they're, make, they're having some success or are contri contributing to the overall success. Ron, you, I think you drew an important distinction in the religious conservative community between evangelicals and presumably fundamentalists on one hand and, uh, and, 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 and Catholics on the other. Yeah. The presumption was when the president named Amy Coney Barrett as his nominee for the U.S. Supreme Court, that that would help motivate or bring back wayward uh, Catholic voters, particularly Catholic female voter, Catholic female voters in his camp. Is there any indica is there indication that that's happened? Well, we know that first of all, we know that a majority of white Catholics are pro-choice, which is worth noting, uh, uh, and do not think Roe should be overturned. Um, Again, I think it's hard to answer that, Dan, because the polling we have on white Catholics is uh, the PRI came out yesterday and they have a bigger sample. And I don't remember uh, we could someone could Google it while we're, we're here and tell us if you look at the Public Religion Research Institute poll yesterday, whether they show decline for Trump among white Catholics. But that was taken in September. 
anyway, that poll. I don't think Trump is going to match his 2016 numbers among white Catholics, where I think he was pretty close to, to 60 percent. Um, uh, I, I think he'll probably win them, but he'll win them narrowly, again, as part of the general erosion among kind of, you know, white uh, ethnic and white non-college voters. Um, uh, so I don't know. I mean, I, I think Barrett uh, Democrats, you know, chose not to totally go to the mat over this in a way that would make it a central issue. Um, uh, I think they could, you know, uh, pay some price for that uh, in terms of what she may be willing to do on the Supreme Court uh, before or after the election um, to help Trump. Uh, but I don't, think it's, I don't it's a mover, mover. Okay. And what I will say, just taking a quick look at a new story out of the a PRI poll that you mentioned. Yeah. It appears that Barrett was something that many Christian and Catholic voters found attractive, but to yeah. some degree, going back to a point that you made earlier, it's been outweighed with many Christian voters by their disappointment in the president's handling of the pandemic. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, I mean, 60, in, in some ways, this election, there's a certain kind of, you know, uh, elemental simplicity of this election. 60% of the country disapproves of the way he's, he's handled the pandemic. Uh, and he's having trouble getting his vote. Uh, Great. So let's move on now. So let's move on now. Getting a bit of echo here. Um, okay, let's try this. So if we remove states with a 5% margin of error, what is the current snapshot of electoral votes for Biden v. Trump? And I don't know if you'll know that 5% error off the top of your head, but I think more so what states can we really count on for each yeah. camp? Well, look, I mean, as I, as I said before, I mean, you, you, you can think of the, uh, the swing states in a couple tiers. Uh, the inner tier of competitive states are three in the Rust Belt, Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and three in the Sun Belt, North Carolina, Florida, and um, Arizona. And then you have the next tier of competitive states beyond that, which are Ohio, Iowa, and Trump hoping to put Minnesota in play in the Rust Belt, and then Georgia, Texas, and Trump hoping to put Nevada in play in the Sun Belt. Right now, you would say Biden's advantage in the three inner tier Rust Belt swing states, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania, the three states from the blue wall that Trump dislodged in 2016 is bigger than five points. I think it's bigger than five points in all of them at this point. It's probably somewhere between seven and nine points. In Michigan, it may be double digits. Um, but again, that doesn't mean he can count on those states because of what we've been talking about, which is you know, if there is a, a significant uh, shift in the composition of the electorate, uh, from more non-college whites than uh, than the pollsters expect. The Rust Belt, you know, I think he's somewhere between two and four points, maybe five points at the most. I'd say two to four probably ahead in North Carolina, Florida, and Arizona. I think Arizona is the most stable of those. Uh, and after that, uh, you know, they're about they look to be about even in Georgia. Maybe Trump a step ahead in uh, Ohio uh, and Iowa. Texas is intriguing, and we, I'd love to talk more about Texas at some point. Um, and then I think Minnesota and Nevada remain very hard uh, for Trump. But again, if you're winning, you know, 60 percent of non-college whites, you stay in the game kind of everywhere. Um, so if Trump, if Biden holds all of the 20 states that Hillary Clinton won, which I think is the most likely outcome, adds Michigan, Wisconsin and Pennsylvania, we're done. Uh, if he adds Arizona as a uh, offset to, I believe, he, certainly Wisconsin or Michigan. But even if he loses Pennsylvania, I'm pretty sure that, uh, let's see, uh, Wisconsin, Yes, Wisconsin, Arizona, and Michigan would get you to 270 as well. So he's kind of got four states where his lead seems relatively secure. Florida and North Carolina, I mean, who would be shocked if in the end Trump, you know, today you'd have to say Biden is a little bit favored in both of them, but would anybody be shocked if Trump in the end wins North Carolina? Uh, and even if he wins Florida, I mean, Florida might be a little more surprising, but uh, I wouldn't be shocked. I mean, uh, uh, you know, Steve Shale, who's the, the, the longtime Democratic strategist, said that of all the total votes cast, in Florida presidential election since 1992, I think he said it was 50 million. Uh, there's like a 20,000 vote difference between the parties total. <laughs> let's, um, Claire, let's grant Ron's wish and let's talk about Texas for a minute, Ron. So yeah. for years, the Democrats have been tantalized with the idea of turning what was once a deep red state for Democrat, either for statewide office or presidential campaign. They've made significant progress yeah. in House races and in the state legislature there. Is this the year that Texas goes blue or is that still four years off? Um, 
I, you know, Texas to me is the embodiment of, you know, what's happening as our politics kind of separates in this coalition of transformation and coalition of restoration. Uh, and it is a, it, it is the opposite pole from New York, New Jersey, and Texas. And it is a reminder that we are seeing the same politics in every state, no matter how blue or how red, with the Democrats gaining ground inside of the metros, inside of the places that are adding people and jobs and economic output, and Republicans consolidating their hold on the places outside of them. I mean, the, 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 the big story in Texas uh, is, to me, potentially the biggest potentially lasting impact biggest of this election. Impact. You know, um, you know uh, I've said before, as I think what we're talking about, the tipping point of this election will probably be whether or not Biden can win back enough blue collar whites to reattach Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin to the blue wall. That'll probably decide 2020. But the most lasting impact of this election will be if the big metros of the Sun Belt begin to behave more like the big metros on the coasts and in the north. And it's been, you know, a long process. I mean, first we saw California, Illinois, New Jersey suburbs move toward the Democrats under Clinton. Then we saw Colorado, Northern Virginia, and Mecklenburg and Wake in North Carolina move toward the Democrats under Obama. And now you are seeing that same shift happening in Atlanta, Phoenix, Houston, Dallas, and the suburbs of Austin and San Antonio. Um, you know, uh, in 20. 12, Obama won the five largest counties in Texas by a combined 130,000 votes. Uh, in 2018, uh, Beto won those same counties by 790,000 votes. It is possible that Biden will win the four metro areas in Texas by more than a million votes. He could win Harris County, Houston. Obama won it by like 1,000 votes. Biden could win it by about 300,000 votes. I mean, he could win Dallas by around 300,000 votes. He might even win Austin by around 250, 300,000 votes. And yet, he may still lose the state. He may still lose the state. You know, you have to bet on it, probably, because Trump can turn out so much of the rural parts of the state. But, you know, the trajectory is pretty unmistakable, and, and also because Democrats are going to struggle to get their turnout to where they need it uh, in the heavily Hispanic Rio Grande Valley. But if you're losing, the, the places that I'm describing, the four big metro areas, Dallas, Fort Worth, Austin, San Antonio, and um, uh, Houston account for three quarters of the state's economic output, 70% of its jobs, six of the 10 fastest growing counties in the country uh, from 2010 to 2019 are in Texas. If you start losing them by a million votes plus, I mean, you know, you don't have to like, you don't have to be uh, an economist to kind of draw the trend line of what's happening. Eventually you run out of kind of people in Nacogdoches uh, and Odessa <laughs> and Midland to overcome that. So they may be able to hold it off they're going to redistrict the hell out of Democrats if they if they if they can. They've got the Texas State Supreme Court and the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, each of which function as arms of the Republican Party in Texas. So they've got a lot of weapons to hold this back. Uh, but uh, what was the what was the album title? It takes a nation of millions to hold us back. I mean, it it, it is going to be awful hard if you're losing the metros by those margins to maintain an advantage. And that's plus. Two thirds of everybody who turned 18 and eligible to vote in Texas since 2016 are, are kids of color. Let the record show that Ron Brown's team can cite both Ted Williams and NWA in one hour long conversation. <laughs> Great. Well, on the topic of specific states, we've got a few people that are really interested in Florida. So yeah. this is kind of two questions. Number one, what are the key demographic groups required to win Florida? And then the voting groups in Florida that are making this outcome a toss up. Right. So as I said, Steve Shale, I'm going to get the numbers slightly wrong, and I commend you to either his blog post or more easily, you can find my piece on why the Southeast is up for grabs in CNN.com two weeks ago, which has a link to his blog post. But it's something like out of 15 million votes since 1992, the two parties are separated by 20,000. Florida is a Rubik's cube. I quoted one Democratic pollster as saying, the, the only rule of Florida is that the winning coalition never looks the same two elections in a row, right? Uh, so if you're Joe Biden, you're saying, wow, I am now in position and clearly consistently in polling, he is winning over half of college educated whites in Florida. Democrats don't do that. He's going to do better than any recent Democratic nominee among college educated whites. He's improving among seniors. You saw the carts out, you know, in the villages, you know, the not only the Trump golf cart parades, but now the Biden uh, golf cart parades. Um, so you say, wow, okay, you know, and, and he's, you know, maybe cutting in just a little in the panhandle and uh, other places with lots of blue collars. But then he's got, you know, okay, so all of that's the Rubik's Cube is all coming up. And then you kind of turn the other way. 
uh, Cuban voters are reverting back to very strongly Republican, uh, and he is not fully performing among other Central and South Americans. And even in some polling, he's underperforming rather incredibly, given Trump's posture uh, among Puerto Ricans. So on balance, I would say Biden's strength among college whites and his um, cutting of the margins among white seniors makes him the favorite. But, you know, a point and a half in Florida is a landslide, uh, given how tightly balanced the state has been. Uh, and, you know, uh, no Democrat should ever be in a position of counting on Florida. I mean, and luckily for Biden, he isn't. I mean, he is, he is based, you know, whatever else you can say about Biden, he has not taken his eye off the ball. Hillary Clinton didn't go to Michigan or Wisconsin famously until the very end. You know, she just pounded away at North Carolina and Florida. Biden is, you know, it's three, as I said in my story today, you know, it's Ohio State football was three yards in a cloud of dust. Biden is three states in a cloud of dust. I mean, he is laser focused on Pennsylvania, laser Michigan, Pennsylvania, 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 Florida also in there. Florida also in there. Great. So, so now kind of going more into the candidates, um, if Biden does win, will it be the case that it took COVID uh, to get Trump out? For example, would Trump have beaten Biden without a pandemic in the last seven to eight no. months? No, I mean, like, it's astonishing. If you look at some of the polling averages, like real clear politics, the average last October and going into the first debate was almost exactly the same. Biden was ahead by the same amount, about seven points. I mean, Trump's problem, even before I mean, I, I, you know, the senior thing has gotten worse for Trump in the, in, the, in, the, in the pandemic. But even before the pandemic, he faced this extraordinary situation where consistently, and I wrote about this a lot, 20% of people who said they approved of his handling of the economy said they disapproved of him overall and were voting for Biden. And that was heavily concentrated among those white college suburbanites who are doing well. I mean, you can look at polling even now. I mean, there's, there's polling in states where 80% of college whites will describe their financial situation as excellent or good, but 60% of them are voting for Biden. I saw that in Pennsylvania the other day. Um, Trump's situation, I think COVID made it worse, and uh, he will certainly argue that, you know, I was going to win until China uh, unleashed, unleashed this virus. But I don't think it has, I mean, it, it has made it more difficult for him. But I don't think, I think, I think, I think the basic structure of the race was shaped before this happened. Um, where Trump governed essentially as the president of Red America and made no effort to reach out to anyone beyond his coalition and, in fact, uh, governed in a very hostile way toward them, you know, ending the state and local tax deduction, trying to cut off funding, uh, trying to overturn the California EPA waiver. I mean, just endless lists, attacking governors. Um, he basically left himself in a position where the only way to win was to hit 406 among his core groups and to turn a lot of them out. And I don't think, you know, he will certainly argue that. And in a way, that's good for Democrats because it will keep the Republicans locked on a Trumpian path uh, as the country continues to diversify. He will, he will basically argue if he loses, this was why, but I don't think it was why. Ron, Ron it's been reported that uh, many of Trump's advisors are somewhat frustrated that he's not willing to spend more time talking about the economy, how yeah. strong it was before the pandemic and how it's on a path to recovery. Yeah. If he were develop, delivering a more conventional economic growth message, do you think he would be in, do you think his prospects would, 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 have, would, would be better? Yeah, I do. I mean, I think there's a lot of those college white men who are voting for Biden are not really Democrats. I mean, they don't, they don't believe in an activist government. I mean, they are culturally, more Democrats. But generally speaking, they like low taxes, low regulation. They're dubious of, you know, spending the money to build 500,000 charging stations and raising taxes. Uh, but Trump, look, Trump believes that his Trump card is cultural and racial grievance, you know, and that's what he goes to all the time. When all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And, you know, uh, you say, why is he attacking Fauci? Why is he threatening to lock up, you know, his predecessor? Um, I think it's all, it's because he, you know, he is trying to uh, just activate the most alienated elements of society and turn more of them out. Um, and, you know, a, a, a more conventional, your 401k is up, uh, just gets in, you know, just doesn't have the same ring to him. And also, once you're doing the first thing, Dan, you can't really do the second. I mean, like, if you're going to go out there and say, Barack Obama should be prosecuted, Joe Biden should be prosecuted, Hillary Clinton should be prosecuted, Anthony Fauci is an idiot, Fauci's and oh, idiot. by the way, your 401k oh, is up. I don't think I don't think 
you're gonna you're gonna really win back the target okay. of that. Who has who has that? Who has, look at who owns stock in the country. It's mostly you know uh, mostly upper income people, well you know college educated people, and they are so repulsed by the behavior. I think the economic uh, message really would not it would have some impact, but not it would have some impact. But Great. So we have just a few more questions to get through. Oh, we have a lot more questions, but we're going to try to go right up to the end with, with questions. Sure. So um, is Biden doing enough to ensure that the Latino vote breaks sufficiently in his direction? No. I mean, they're spending a lot of money now on radio uh, and television, uh, and they certainly spend a lot of money in Arizona. But, you know, they chose, look, again, Biden is not the perfect candidate to do that. Democrats have struggled to do that for years. The groups that try to do it are, uh, you know, historically underfunded. And the Democratic side made the choice not to go door to door or to resume in-person activities. And I think that has hurt them. And I don't think Hispanic turnout will be as high as they hope, although it may be a little better than 2016. The question is, how much does the margin go down, uh, you know, given the possibility that Trump will run better among the men than he did last time? Great. Um, and what is it about Trump and his presidency that is, attract, that is attracting young Black and Hispanic men? I mean, that's a great question. And, you know, Democrats are really puzzling over this. Part of it is just the, is the swagger and the kind of the rule breaking. Uh, and, you know, there, there is a response to his kind of tough guy act. And I'm kind of channeling the Black and Hispanic Democratic bolsters that I've talked to about this. There's also a sense that um, uh, neither party has met their needs. I mean, they're there was a, a, a black man quoted in a focus group and also virtually an another person, virtual identical terms in an LA Times piece in Atlanta, both saying basically every white politician is a racist, at least Trump is honest about it. Um, so I think there's kind of a, there's a long-term alienation that Democrats are gonna have to deal with uh, uh, here, but I, I think a lot of it is just his style. Someone said to me, you know, look, I mean, young, Black and Hispanic men consume a lot of the same media as young non-college white men, you know? And um, uh, we're talking particularly about non-college Black and Hispanic young men, I should, I should point out. Uh, and so are responding to some of the same cues that Trump is sending out uh, among them, that he's a tough guy, that he breaks the norms, that he doesn't take no crap from nobody and all of that. All right, this will be the final audience question before I turn it back over to Dan. And this is for both of you. What do you feel uh, the effects of voter suppression will have on the election? A lot, I think. I mean, I think it matters. I mean, it, it, you know, I think in a state like Georgia or Florida, uh, it is, and Texas certainly, they, you know, you are seeing a Republican party that has chosen to try to, not to speak to the emerging America, but to try to prevent it as much as it can from voting, and I think it does matter, and I think it could, it could, you know, Georgia is certainly a state that could be tipped by by that kind of activity, and you know, the courts are, are you know, you're seeing these Republican appointed justice uh, judges on the appellate courts repeatedly siding with the GOP, inevitably siding with the GOP, and and the Supreme Court at the end of the line, once Barrett is on there, I think it's going to be very similar. I think Ron made a really important point in in passing in, in his answer about the Republican Party's future. It's worth looking back at the Republican Party's past, because after the 2012 election, as, as Ron knows very, very well, the Republican National Committee commissioned a study. Uh, some of the uh, party's most accomplished strategists to examine what was going wrong. And almost unanimously, these strategists said, we need to, the, the, the Republican Party needs to make a better and a more consistent and a more sincere effort to reach out to Latino, to African-American, Asian Pacific, and the younger voters. Many of the Republican candidates in 2016 in the primary espoused that approach. Jeb Bush, Marco Rubio, and plenty of others. It turned out that a sizable base of the party wasn't ready for that message yet. Regardless of whether Donald Trump wins re-election or not, there's going to be a brawl for the future of the Republican Party between what I'll call the pro-Trumpers and the pre-Trumpers, and a, yeah, a faction of the party that has not been comfortable with the president is going to have to decide if eight years later they can be more successful in accomplishing the kind of minority community outreach that Ron was talking about earlier. Um, the fight between those two groups will make the Sanders-Clinton fight look like a garden party 
pool by comparison, and it will go from November 4th until the nomination is decided in, in 2024. Ron, we're right up at noon, and so I'm going to segue, not to show any disrespect to Claire, of course, but to segue right into our heartfelt thanks and gratitude for you joining us today. Um, I think I speak for most of our audience that we would like to have you with us at least once a day for the next 14 days and beyond. We know your schedule doesn't allow, and we're just thrilled that you're always willing to take the time to talk to us. Um, your knowledge of not just politics, but sports, music, and every other aspect of American society is encyclopedic, and we're, we're thrilled to have you with us as always. Hey, Dan, I was thinking, is that a standing invitation? <laughs> No, it expires after the election. Yeah. <laughs> yes, of, 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 um, if if we would be so presumptuous. No, I'm uh, saying a standing invitation since I, that's what I'm doing now. Oh, a clever pun it's on it's half it's of, whoop, whoop, right whoop. my head because of course I'm sitting. Yes. Um, but Ron, I'm going to turn it back over to Kim. But on behalf of everyone, thank you so much for being with us thank today. You. Thanks for having me, guys. And both. Thank you both. Right. Thank you both so much for providing this important analysis on what you described, Ron, as the Rubik's Cube of this election. I think that will stick. And we are so appreciative that you are with us today in spite of your back issues. And we wish you well. I know that's uh, very painful. So thank you. You can come standing, sitting, or lounging on for any, any future. And, and I might. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thank you. And for those of you who are watching, um, Please help us uh, support the organization by uh, texting the word election to the number on the screen. We need your support. And please go to our website at LAWACTH and sign up for future programs. We've got some terrific 2020 election series with Dan coming up and of course his politics uh, in the time of the coronavirus. Everybody please stay safe, stay informed, and we'll see you soon.